Access, Arizona's Medicaid agency, is pleased to offer this training presentation on court-ordered evaluation, also called COE, and court-ordered treatment, also called COT. In this presentation, we will provide detailed information about the COE, COT processes found in Arizona Revised Statute, Title 36, Chapter 5, available at azledge.gov slash ARS title. This presentation will help you understand the Arizona COE, COT processes, understand why a person might need court-ordered evaluation and treatment, and understand the COE, COT processes from beginning to end. Because these processes can suspend the rights a person has in Arizona, it is important to follow them exactly as intended in order to protect all parties involved. By the end of this presentation, we hope that you'll have a better understanding of the reasons a person might need court-ordered treatment, the process of obtaining court-ordered involuntary evaluation and treatment from the initial application through final release, the procedure for voluntary evaluation and treatment, the Arizona Revised Statutes, Title 36, Chapter 5, and the Arizona Administrative Code that dictate the standards for COE, COT, and best practices and cross-agency protocols that promote the administration of justice for persons with mental illness. COE and COT embody a legal concept known as involuntary civil commitment, which is older legal terminology that has fallen out of favor in Arizona, giving rise to the terms court-ordered evaluation and court-ordered treatment. In Arizona, law-abiding persons with a mental health condition generally enjoy the right not to be confined for involuntary mental health treatment unless a risk of harm or deterioration can be demonstrated to justify such confinement. The legal process for doing so happens during court-ordered evaluation and court-ordered treatment, otherwise known as a Title 36 case. The existence of a rights-based legal process for involuntary mental health treatment developed slowly over the centuries. In the late 18th century, there were few psychiatric hospitals and it was common for people with a mental health condition to be jailed, to live in shelters, or to become transient and homeless. In the 19th century, a need for large scale buildings of state run psychiatric hospitals was widely promoted. Once committed, the only way for a patient to be released was to sue for wrongful commitment or to seek release from a judge. During the mid 20th century, Preferences for psychiatric care shifted from an emphasis on long-term inpatient care to outpatient community-based care. This movement was known as deinstitutionalization. During the era of deinstitutionalization, the Supreme Court issued a 1975 landmark ruling in the case of O'Connor versus Donaldson, which established a basic constitutional standard for civil commitment cases. Donaldson's father had placed his son in a Florida state-run psychiatric hospital based only on the need for treatment. Donaldson remained there for 15 years before suing and winning damages in federal court. The Supreme Court ruled that a state cannot constitutionally confine a non-dangerous individual who is capable of surviving safely in freedom by himself or with the help of willing and responsible family members or friends. The current legal framework reflecting the rights-based process for COE, COT, got its start in 1974 with the passage of the Arizona Mental Health Services Act, which included prohibiting pre-hearing detention in local county jails, establishing time limits on the petition process, establishing periodic judicial review of confinement instead of indefinite confinement, and encouraging the use of voluntary admission where appropriate. Today in Arizona, Title 36 processes are used when a person undergoing a crisis needs fast access to psychiatric care or where those not in immediate crisis nonetheless face a danger of substantial deterioration without involuntary treatment. 
These processes are intended to protect and improve the lives of people living with mental illness, their family and friends, and the greater society around them. The Title 36 processes for pre-partition screening, court-ordered evaluation, and court-ordered treatment are designed to get help to people who are unwilling or incapable of providing consent to receive behavioral health services. These processes are intended to protect people from being a danger to self or others, or to help people who are persistently and acutely disabled by a mental illness or are gravely disabled and at a risk for deterioration and harm. The Title 36 processes are not intended to treat substance abuse disorders and should never be used as a means of punishment or coercion or to build a legal case against another individual. Let's cover some terminology used in this presentation. Pre-partition screening is a professional analysis of an application for court-ordered evaluation by a licensed behavioral health medical professional to ensure that reasonable cause exists and determine that it is appropriate and ready to be filed with the court. Before someone can petition the court for a court-ordered evaluation, they must fill out an application for the evaluation. This application is filed with an agency that is authorized and licensed to receive the application. The application is reviewed by licensed professionals to determine reasonable cause. In other words, that it is valid and necessary. This is called pre-petition screening, and it is the starting point of the COE-COT process. Court-ordered evaluation, or COE, is a professional analysis, which may include firsthand or remote observations that is based on data describing the person's identity, biography, and medical, psychological, and social conditions. A court-ordered evaluation is required to determine the severity of a specific mental health concern or to determine an individual's capacity for adequate functioning and is accomplished through the independent evaluation of two behavioral health medical practitioners who assess the patient being held in a behavioral health facility for a limited period of time, up to 72 hours. Court-ordered treatment, or COT, is treatment that is ordered by a court according to Title 36 process and results in the involuntary care and treatment of a person with a mental disorder. Following the pre-petition screening and court-ordered evaluation processes, and in accordance with relevant Arizona laws, an individual can be ordered by the court to undergo mental health treatment if, because of the mental disorder, he or she is a danger to themselves, a danger to others, is persistently and acutely disabled, or is gravely disabled. Mental disorder is a substantial disorder of the person's emotional processes, thought, cognition, or memory, and is distinguished from the following. Conditions that are primarily those of drug use, alcoholism, or intellectual disability, unless in addition to one or more of those conditions, the person has a mental disorder. The declining mental abilities that directly accompany impending death and personality disorders characterized by lifelong and deeply ingrained antisocial behavior patterns, including sexual behaviors that are abnormal and prohibited by statute unless the behavior results from a mental disorder. Danger to self, or DTS, means behavior that because of a mental disorder constitutes a danger of inflicting serious physical harm on oneself, including attempted suicide or the serious threat thereof. It includes behaviors that, without hospitalization, will result in serious physical harm or serious illness to the person and does not include behavior that establishes only the condition of being gravely disabled. You will hear an example of such behavior later in this training. Danger to others, or DTO, means behavior that, because of a mental disorder, constitutes a danger of inflicting serious harm to others. You will hear an example of such behavior later in this training. Persistently and acutely disabled, or PAD, means 
the person's severity of symptoms of a mental disorder that, if not treated, has a substantial probability of causing the person to suffer or continue to suffer severe and abnormal mental, emotional, or physical harm that significantly impairs judgment, reason, behavior, or capacity to recognize reality. The person's symptoms substantially impair the person's capacity to make an informed decision regarding treatment, and this impairment causes the person to be incapable of understanding and expressing an understanding of the advantages and disadvantages of accepting treatment and understanding and expressing an understanding of the alternatives to the particular treatment offered after the advantages, disadvantages, and alternatives are explained to that person. You will hear an example of such behavior later in this training. Gravely disabled, or GD, means a condition evidenced by behavior in which a person, because of a mental disorder, is likely to come to serious physical harm or serious illness because the person is unable to provide for their own basic physical needs. When a person is petitioned for being gravely disabled, the court investigates the potential need for guardianship or conservatorship, or both. You will hear an example of such behavior later in this training. There are two approaches that can be taken to court-ordered evaluation, emergent and non-emergent. The emergent approach is used when the person in question presents as an immediate danger to self or DTS, or danger to others or DTO. The non-emergent approach is used when the person in question will experience imminent harm if left untreated. The COE-COT process involves many steps. Once an application for COE has been filled out, signed, and notarized, it is submitted for pre-petition screening. If found appropriate, the application leads to a petition for court-ordered evaluation. Once evaluated and found appropriate, the court is petitioned for court-ordered treatment. The process begins with pre-petition screening. The court can be petitioned for involuntary evaluation on either an emergent or non-emergent basis. Once an application for involuntary evaluation is completed, it must be notarized before being submitted to a screening agency. Behavioral health screening agencies and their satellite offices are located throughout the state of Arizona. Call the nearest agency to confirm that they accept applications. A local crisis line can also advise applicants where to go. Next, the applicant and the person for whom court-ordered evaluation and treatment is sought go to a screening agency. The applicant should be ready to provide the facts as to why the proposed patient qualifies for emergency admission. If the applicant filed an emergency application, because the proposed patient is a danger to themselves or others, the pre-petition screening can take place at an emergency room or crisis center. If the person is not present at the screening agency, the local emergency medical services can be called or law enforcement will try to find the person and bring them to a screening agency or emergency room where they can be screened by a mobile crisis unit as soon as possible. Once at a facility, a psychiatrist will complete the screening and decide whether to approve the petition for court-ordered evaluation. A pre-petition screening is conducted at a behavioral health care agency if the person with an alleged mental disorder is in non-emergent circumstances. The screening agency reviews the allegations presented in the application, gathers relevant information, and conducts an interview with the person if possible. The screening agency then determines if there is reasonable cause to believe that the proposed patient is, because of mental disorder, a danger to themselves or others, is persistently and acutely disabled, or is gravely disabled, and if they are unable to or unwilling to receive an evaluation on a voluntary basis. If reasonable cause exists, an examiner from the screening agency may file a petition for court-ordered evaluation, subjecting the person to a mental health evaluation. The petition for court-ordered evaluation may be conducted on an outpatient basis, or the court may require the person to be hospitalized for the evaluation. After an evaluation for involuntary evaluation has been filed with a behavioral health agency, 
the agency has 24 hours to conduct a pre-petition screening. The 24-hour period does not include weekends or holidays. So if an application is submitted on a Friday, the agency has until the end of the following Monday to complete the screening. In most cases, the proposed patient is assigned a caseworker by the screening agency. The caseworker meets with them to determine the following, where they live and if they are able to provide for their basic needs, their cognitive functioning level, if they are able to listen and follow directions, if they are willing to take medication, if they are addicted to drugs or alcohol and need to detox, and if they will voluntarily take part in improving their behavioral health situation. The screening will determine whether reasonable cause exists to believe the allegations set forth in the application are accurate and whether the person has the capacity to voluntarily accept treatment. If at any point in the screening, they determine the person does not need treatment, they will be discharged. The screening agency will explain the difference between voluntary and involuntary evaluation and treatment. The screening will also end if the person agrees to receive voluntary treatment at any time during the pre-petition screening. If the person conducting the screening suspects substance abuse, not a mental disorder, the screener may wait for a period of time to see if the person detoxes. If the person detoxes, and does not show signs of a mental disorder, the application gets dropped since substance abuse does not fall under Title 36. If all criteria are met, the pre-petition screening agency will prepare a pre-petition report detailing that there exists reasonable cause to believe the allegations detailed on the application for the court-ordered evaluation. The report is reviewed by the medical director of the screening agency or the medical director's designee. If the agency determines that there is reasonable cause to believe that the proposed patient is, because of mental disorder, a DTS or DTO, or is PAD or GD, and that the proposed patient is unwilling or unable to voluntarily receive evaluation, the agency will prepare a petition for court-ordered evaluation and will file the petition with the court. If the agency determines that there is reasonable cause to believe that the proposed patient is likely to cause harm to themselves or someone else, the agency will take all reasonable steps to procure hospitalization on an emergent basis. If the agency medical director or designee determines that an emergency examination is necessary, a pickup order can be issued to law enforcement in order to transport the proposed patient from a community location or the screening agency, if that agency does not perform evaluations, in order to bring them to the evaluation agency location. If the law enforcement officer executing a pickup order follows statute in good faith, he or she is not subject to civil liability. If the proposed patient is not brought in for evaluation within 14 days, the petition expires. Please be aware that the law enforcement transport itself can be a traumatic event because the transport includes the use of a police car, handcuffs, and physical searches due to specific custody safety procedures. After the pre-petition screening, the Behavioral Health Agency will determine whether the proposed patient meets the criteria for involuntary evaluation. One of four things may then take place. One, the screening agency will file an application for court-ordered evaluation with the court. If approved, a pickup order is sent to local law enforcement to bring the person to the hospital for court-ordered evaluation. This is the non-emergent approach. Two, during the screening, if the agency determines that the proposed patient is an immediate threat to themselves or others, an emergency admission for evaluation may be necessary and the emergent approach is employed. Three, it is not unusual for the proposed patient to agree to voluntary treatment during the pre-petition screening process. The patient would then be connected to voluntary treatment either in the hospital or as an outpatient and there is no need for a petition for evaluation or the associated court hearing 
or four, if the screening agency staff believe that the individual does not meet the requirements for quartered evaluation, they will deny the application. Now let's explore the court-ordered evaluation process. This flowchart shows the step-by-step -step process for court-ordered evaluation. It begins with pre-petition screening, which takes place within 48 hours, then petitioning the court for involuntary evaluation. If an evaluation is ordered by the court, a pickup order is issued if the person is not presented for evaluation during the pre-petitioning process, or if the person is not already at the evaluating agency. Then the evaluation is conducted by two qualifying behavioral health medical practitioners who assess the person within 72 hours. If the evaluating agency determines the proposed patient meets the criteria for court-ordered treatment, a petition for COT is prepared and filed with the court. In Arizona, the court may order a patient to undergo inpatient treatment within a psychiatric hospital or outpatient treatment in the community if there is clear and convincing evidence that the proposed patient, because of mental disorder, is DTS, DTO, PAD, or GD, and is either unwilling or unable to accept voluntary treatment. Any responsible individual may apply for an evaluation by submitting an application describing the behaviors that are of concern and which affect the health and safety of the proposed patient or others. For help completing the application, call a local crisis line. There are two approaches for petitioning, emergent for danger to self and danger to others, and non-emergent for persistently and acutely disabled or gravely disabled. People with mental health issues can live happy and productive lives without the need for hospitalization. By its nature, involuntary treatment denies someone a portion of their civil rights. Therefore, the process to approve it is careful and lengthy. For non-emergent situations, demonstrating a recent history of behaviors associated with a mental disorder can be difficult. Some things that can be included are dangerous hoarding or unsanitary conditions that could pose a health risk to themselves or others, being unable to complete daily tasks like showering, putting on clothes, or finding food, and increasing the severity of self-harming behaviors such as cutting. Here's an example scenario of a DTS application for COE. Mary is a 28-year-old female with two prior suicide attempts. Her boyfriend of two years ends the relationship abruptly, and she falls into a deep depression. After several weeks of having no contact with anyone, she calls her mother to state that she is thinking of ending her life. At her apartment, Mary's mother finds that Mary has amassed a large quantity of tranquilizers and is planning on overdosing. Mary's mother takes her to a screening and evaluation agency and fills out an application for court-ordered evaluation. Here's an example of a DTO application for COE. Bob is a 24-year-old male with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder stemming from his military service during the Afghanistan war. When he returned from his tour of duty, he began experiencing symptoms, including reliving the traumatic wartime events, intrusive, distressing recollections, and distressing dreams, difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep, hypervigilance, irritability, and angry outbursts. One day, his neighbor began to harass him for not keeping up his yard, and the two became engaged in a verbal argument. Bob began making threats towards the neighbor eventually retrieving a gun from his home and pointing it at the neighbor, saying he was going to kill him. Bob would not listen to family members who were trying to intervene. 911 was called, and police officers were able to get the gun from him. But he refused to go to the hospital voluntarily and continued to make threats toward the neighbor, saying again that he would kill him. Police transported him to a screening and evaluation agency, and Title 36 paperwork was started. Here's an example scenario of an individual who was persistently and acutely disabled. Mark is a 32-year-old male with a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. He has frequent delusions. 
believing that anything that goes into his body is poison and will harm him, including the food he eats and his prescribed medication. His mom has been successful in helping him through these delusions. However, she recently passed away. Mark has been staying with his brother. Mark is currently not eating, has lost a lot of weight in a short amount of time, and refuses his medication. His brother goes to the screening and evaluation agency and fills out a non-emergent application for evaluation. Probable cause is established and a pickup order has been issued so law enforcement can bring Mark in to be evaluated. Here's an example of an individual who is gravely disabled and an application for non-emergent COE. Karen is a 31-year-old female with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who reportedly lost weight to the point of her ribs sticking out. She is not attending to her hygiene, and she is not eating due to the belief that food is poison. She reportedly urinates and defecates on herself and then becomes upset with her family for trying to clean her. She reports being pregnant by her ex-boyfriend and because he did not want the baby, he put his whole arm and snakes inside of her and the snakes ate the fetus. She believes there is glue in her spine and it is moving to her brain, causing her to make bad decisions. She refuses voluntary treatment, saying that she does not need to go to the hospital. Karen's case manager believes her symptoms are becoming worse, so she works with the clinic's director to file a non-emergent application for court-ordered evaluation and determine whether she needs a court-appointed guardian. Often, when someone is PAD, they are also DTS and or DTO or some combination of the four categories. More than one category can be used to express a combined issue. Applicants for COE should discuss this with the screening agency to ensure the application is clear. The family plays a very important role in this process. Often it is a family member who is applying for court-ordered evaluation because they have firsthand knowledge of and have witnessed the concerning behaviors. They may be the only source of support for the person being considered for COE, COT. Family members are frequently involved in treatment when the person has signed a release allowing the free sharing of information between them and the clinical team. The proposed patient may have the ability to find out who signed the application for court-ordered evaluation and who were the witnesses of the concerning behaviors. These elements are not sealed nor prevented from being able to be discovered. The application for court-ordered evaluation must include the following, the name and address if known of the proposed patient for whom an evaluation is sought, the age, date of birth, sex, race, marital status, occupation, social security number, present location, dates and places of previous hospitalizations, names and addresses of the guardian, spouse, next of kin, and significant other persons and other data that the screening agency may require on the form to whatever extent the information is known and applicable to the proposed patient. The name and address of the person who is applying for the evaluation and the relationship to the proposed patient. A statement that the proposed patient is believed to be, because of mental disorder, a danger to self or others, or a patient who is persistently and acutely disabled or gravely disabled, and the facts on which this statement is based, and a statement that the applicant believes the proposed patient needs supervision, care, and treatment, and the facts upon which this statement is based. The application must be signed and legally notarized. The screening agency is required to offer the applicant assistance in preparing the application. On receipt of the application, the screening agency must act as prescribed in Section 36-521 of the applicable statutes within 48 hours of the filing of the application, excluding weekends and holidays. If the application is not acted upon within 48 hours, the reasons for not acting promptly will be reviewed by the director of the screening agency or the director's designee. If the applicant for the court ordered evaluation presents the proposed patient to be evaluated at the screening agency, the agency will conduct a pre-petition screening examination. Except in the case of an emergent approach to evaluation, 
the proposed patient will not be detained or forced to undergo pre-petition screening against their will. If the applicant for the court-ordered evaluation does not present the proposed patient to be evaluated at the screening agency, the agency will conduct the pre-petition screening at the home or in the community of the proposed patient. If pre-petition screening is not possible, the screening agency will write a report detailing why the screening could not be completed, including the opinions and conclusions of the staff, and will submit the report to the agency's director or designee, who may in turn submit the report to the county attorney for consideration. The county attorney may then file the petition with a court for emergency hospitalization. If the proposed patient is being treated by prayer or spiritual means alone in accordance with the tenets and practices of a recognized church or religious denomination by a duly accredited practitioner of that church or denomination, the proposed patient may not be ordered, evaluated, detained, or involuntarily treated unless the court has determined that the person is, as a result of mental disorder, a DTS or DTO. If the application is not act upon due to determination that the proposed patient does not need an evaluation, the agency will destroy the application and all documents associated with the application after a period of six months. Note, documents must be from the state of Arizona. The applicant must use forms from the county in which the petition will be filed. All areas of the forms must be completed with no blanks on any of the forms. All forms must be signed, dated, and notarized in designated sections. Dates of signature and notary must match. Each county has a distinct approach to COE COT. To file a non-emergent application, contact the Regional Behavioral Health Authority in your area of the state. REBA information is available on the ACCESS website at www.azaccess.gov slash members slash behavioral health services. At any time throughout the pre-petition screening, the proposed patient may choose to receive a voluntary evaluation. When this occurs, a form is filled out by the screening agency, evaluating agency is notified, and the evaluation occurs within five days. The petition for COE is dropped. However, the proposed patient who receives a voluntary evaluation might still be petitioned for COT by the evaluating agency. A petition for guardianship might also be filed with the court depending upon the needs of the proposed patient. Now let's look at the emergent approach to court-ordered evaluation and treatment. Here is the step-by-step -step process to have a potential patient evaluated on an emergent basis. Notice how the process is expedited when the need for emergency hospitalization has been identified. A patient may be in an emergent situation when they are a danger to self or danger to others, and they refuse or are unable to decide to receive voluntary treatment. Patient needs to be hospitalized immediately and without hospitalization, serious physical harm to self or others may occur during the time to complete pre-petition screening procedures. Emergent applications require specific forms that need to be completed by the individuals that witness the behavior. The assisting organization will provide step-by-step -step instructions to follow to complete the forms. There are two applications that can be used to compel someone to receive treatment for a mental illness. Use an application for emergency evaluation when a person is in immediate danger of harming themselves or others and refuses or is unable to decide to receive voluntary treatment. This should be prepared whenever the patient needs to be hospitalized immediately without a court order. If the applicant files an emergency application, they must also submit the application for involuntary evaluation. Use only the application for involuntary evaluation when the proposed patient is not in immediate danger to themselves or someone else and is unwilling or unable 
to consent to voluntary evaluation. All areas must be completed and no blanks are allowed on any of the forms. All forms must be signed, dated, and notarized in designated sections. Dates of signatures and notarization must match. Any reasonable person over the age of 18 that has directly witnessed the concerning behavior may apply for an evaluation. The applicant must present facts to support the allegations made in the application. A statement must be included indicating that, without immediate hospitalization, the proposed patient is likely to suffer serious physical harm or serious illness or is likely to inflict serious physical harm on another person. Depending on the agency and or court, the applicant for COE will need to provide examples of recent concerning behaviors. Behaviors occurring within the last two months are considered recent. Some locations will take older examples, but most often only behaviors in the last six months will be considered relevant. The applicant should confirm with an agency what qualifies as recent behavior. When the petition for involuntary treatment is filed with the court, the applicant will be asked to produce one or two witnesses depending upon the court. Access has divided Arizona into three geographic service areas or GSAs. Northern Arizona, which includes Apache, Coconino, Gila, Mojave, Navajo and Yavapai counties, Central Arizona, which includes Maricopa County, and Southern Arizona, which includes Cochise, Graham, Greenlee, La Paz, Pima, Pinal, Santa Cruz, and Yuma counties. Each county has a distinct approach to COE, COT. To file an emergent application, contact the Regional Behavioral Health Authority, REBA, in your area of the state. REBA information is available on the ACCESS website at azaccess.gov slash members slash behavioral health services or see the resource list at the end of this presentation. Remember, a proposed patient may elect to be evaluated voluntarily at any point in these processes. When a proposed patient chooses to be voluntarily evaluated, the application is voided, the petition is dropped, and is not filed with a court. Now let's look at what happens after the application for COE is accepted. When the application is accepted, the screening agency, medical director, prepares and files the court petition. If the situation is emergent, the petition is filed on the same or the next day. A completed packet includes the application, the pre-petition screening report, the petition itself, and any other forms required by the given county. The petition must include any known criminal history or if the person was ever found to be incompetent to stand trial. If the court determines there is reasonable cause that, because of mental disorder, the person is DTS, DTO, PAD, or GD, an order is issued for involuntary evaluation. After the order for involuntary evaluation is issued by the court, the person is considered a patient and is evaluated as soon as possible. The evaluation may occur in an inpatient or outpatient setting as ordered. An inpatient evaluation must be completed within 72 hours, excluding holidays and weekends. The patient is appointed legal representation and may apply for voluntary treatment. If it has been determined, through the evaluation process that the patient, because of a mental disorder, is a danger to self, a danger to others, is persistently and acutely disabled, or is gravely disabled and has not agreed to voluntary treatment, the medical director files a petition for court-ordered treatment. Let's look at the processes associated with a petition for court-ordered treatment. While each county's petition contains the same content, they may be formatted differently according to the courts. Therefore, it is best to obtain the forms from the agency that will process them. The petition must allege that the patient needs treatment because of a mental disorder that has made the patient a danger to themselves or someone else, or has made them persistently and acutely disabled 
or gravely disabled, that appropriate treatment options are available and that the patient is unwilling or unable to accept voluntary treatment. The petition must include the affidavits of two physicians and their psychiatric evaluations, the treatment plan, and other supporting documents according to each county. After the petition is filed, but before the court hearing, the agency medical director may decide that voluntary treatment is more appropriate and the patient may agree to voluntary treatment. When this occurs, the medical director may seek approval from the court to allow the patient to receive treatment on a voluntary basis. A patient has both civil and legal rights according to Arizona Revised Statutes, Title 36, Chapter 5. The patient's rights shall be brought to the patient's attention as directed by the medical director. Rights must be conspicuously posted in the facility in which the evaluation occurs. An agency evaluating or treating a patient shall immediately notify the patient's guardian or family member of the patient's presence in the agency. The agency shall document all attempts to comply with this requirement. At all hearings, the patient has the right to an analysis of their psychological condition by an independent evaluator. Civil rights, rights to property, litigation, contracting, and voting must not be denied. COT is not a legal determination of incompetency. No person undergoing evaluation or treatment shall be discriminated against on any basis, including employment, professional occupation, obtaining housing, or obtaining licenses permits, such as driving or professional licenses. The patient has the right not to be fingerprinted or photographed without consent, and the right to examine the written treatment plan and their medical record. Patients have the right to individual storage space while undergoing evaluation or treatment, and the right to wear their own clothing keep possessions, and to spend money for their own needs and comfort. The patient has the right to safety considerations, and they must not be denied access to personal property unless a written determination is made justifying the denial. The determination must be placed in the patient's record and made available to the patient's attorney or guardian upon demand. Personal property that the patient cannot use must be placed under control of the patient's guardian, conservator, spouse, or next of kin. If no other person is available or willing to take personal property, the treatment agency shall provide reasonable storage facilities and the patient may apply for court protection of personal property when no alternatives are available to prevent property loss or destruction. The patient has the right to confidential records, with some exceptions as allowed by state or federal law or by court order. If the patient works, the work shall be in the patient's interest. If the patient works for the mental health treatment agency during their stay, they must be paid according to state law. If the purpose of the work is therapeutic, the patient may or may not be paid as circumstances did indicate. The therapeutic work must be documented in the patient's record with the reason for work treatment. The patient has the right to quality treatment and emergency care and the right to refuse medical care. The patient has the right to be free of seclusion or restraint except in cases of emergency for the safety of the patient or others or as part of a written plan of treatment created by the clinical director if the patient is under COT. All seclusion and restraint events must be recorded in the patient's record and follow regulatory requirements. The patient has the right to visitation, telephone, correspondence, and religious freedom, including the right to be visited by their personal physician or other health professional, guardian, agent, attorney, clergyman, or any other person subject to reasonable limitations. They must be given access to a telephone and a confidential location to place phone calls. They have the right to be furnished with stationery and postage and to correspond with any person without censorship 
there are consequences for violating a patient's rights, including knowingly making false statements in support of a petition, which is a class one misdemeanor. Cruelty towards or neglect of a person with a mental disorder is a class two misdemeanor. Court ordered of treatment requires a legal hearing. A hearing must be held within six days after the petition is filed. A copy of the petition and all affidavits must be provided to the patient at least 72 hours in advance of the hearing. The patient has the right to an independent mental health evaluation. If the patient does not have legal counsel, the court shall appoint an attorney at least three days prior to the hearing. Within 24 hours of appointment, the patient's attorney will review the petition and conduct interviews with the patient, petitioner, witnesses, and physicians. The hearing will include testimony of the two physicians who completed the evaluation and the testimony of witnesses. The patient may also testify. Superior court attorneys present the petition to the court and represent the interest of the court and the community. The patient is assigned an attorney through the Office of Public Advocacy, Public Defender's Office to represent their interests and present their defense. The court will order treatment if there is clear and convincing evidence that the patient needs treatment and is unwilling or unable to consent to voluntary treatment. Treatment can be inpatient, outpatient, or a combination of both inpatient and outpatient treatment. The court also has the option to dismiss the case if the evidence does not hold up to legal scrutiny. The configuration of how treatment is ordered by the court varies depending upon the category and severity of risk. Court-ordered treatment cannot exceed 365 days. If the patient is not making progress in treatment by the end of the court order, the court can be repetitioned and in some cases can be extended by the court at the request of the medical director of the agency tasked with managing the patient's care. Besides the imposition of treatment itself, COT does have collateral consequences, including the loss of gun rights in which the patient becomes a prohibited possessor. This means that mere possession of a firearm while on COT or off COT without gun rights having been restored is a class four felony. Careless possession, regardless of ownership of a firearm, can expose patients to a felony conviction, jail or prison time, probation and fines. Even if a patient doesn't intend to possess a firearm after COT is over, they should still petition the court to restore their gun rights to avoid potential exposure to criminal felony charges. Law enforcement officers can see civil commitment status once it is entered into the Arizona Department of Public Safety's database and the National Criminal Background Check databases. There have been known instances where this status has biased officers in how they engaged with patients. Discovery of the patient's civil commitment history can adversely impact things like permitting and employment background checks. While on COT, the patient must remain compliant with their prescribed medications and attend appointments with their prescriber every 30 days. Judicial review is a critical aspect of COT, as it is intended to ensure that the treatment ordered is still necessary every 60 days. Status reports may also be requested by the court. Per Arizona state statute, the provider must ensure that the patient is offered judicial review every 60 days. The individual who offers it must document it to in the patient's clinical record with a progress note indicating a judicial review notification was presented and explained to the patient and what the patient decided. A patient can challenge the COT by requesting a judicial review at any time, but will only have a hearing every 60 days. Judicial review can be offered by any staff appropriately trained to explain to the patient its intent and processes. When judicial review is requested by a patient, 
an appointment with the patient's behavioral health medical practitioner must be scheduled within two days. Some counties may require the review to be completed by a psychiatrist. The court must receive a copy of the request form and a current psychiatric report within three days of the request for judicial review. Courts in some counties may use status reports to track the appropriate execution of the court order. Status reports are optional, but when a status report is requested by a court, the agency overseeing the patient's court ordered treatment should review all court addendums and minute entries to ensure treatment reflects the ways in which it was ordered. Now let's examine the processes for revocations and amendments to the court order. If a patient does not comply with the court ordered treatment plan, the court order can be amended or the outpatient portion revoked. Once the form from the county in which the patient resides is completed and signed by the medical director, the medical director or designee submits it to the appropriate county attorney for filing. The county attorney will file a motion for amendment, apprehension, and transport, and will get the corresponding orders issued and sent to the appropriate law enforcement agency. This allows the law enforcement entity to bring the patient to an inpatient setting when necessary. Process for rehospitalization or outpatient revocation involves filing a notice with the court rather than a motion. The court is simply notified that revocation has occurred as opposed to asking the court to approve it, which is unlike the regular amendment process. The medical director of the outpatient treatment agency can amend or revoke the outpatient portion of the court ordered treatment at any time during the court order. The amended order may alter the outpatient treatment plan or order the patient to inpatient treatment. The amended order cannot increase the total period of commitment originally ordered by the court. If the patient refuses to comply with an amended order for inpatient treatment, the court on its own motion or on the request of the medical director may authorize and direct a law enforcement agency to take the patient into protective custody and to transport the patient to an inpatient treatment location. Court orders are time limited up to 365 days. To prevent them from lapsing when a patient cannot be located, a tolling order can be used. Tolling is the action that pauses the order when a member is unable to be located. Once they are found, the patient must have serve the balance of their COT order. This prevents a patient from hiding out to run out the clock. When the patient is found, they must serve out the balance of days of the court order. Within five days after the treatment agency staff is made aware of the patient's unauthorized absence, the treatment agency shall file a notice with the court which provides the date the absence began and requests treatment order be told. When the court orders the period of court-ordered treatment to be told, notice of the order must be provided to the patient by regular mail at the last known address. Then the treatment agency will begin efforts to re-engage the patient in treatment. These efforts will be documented in the clinical record and will be reported to the court every 60 days or as often as ordered by the court. The patient can also request a judicial review to return to treatment. When the patient is located and returned to treatment, the court will issue an order that provides the period of time that was told. After 180 days, if the patient is not located and returned to treatment, the outpatient agency can request termination of the court order. Termination is at the court's discretion. Termination allows the outpatient agency to cease attempts to locate the patient. Arizona tribes are sovereign nations that have their own COE, COT processes. Tribal courts are courts self-governed by their associated tribe and operate under their tribe's constitution and code of laws. When the tribal court seeks to secure court-ordered treatment off of the reservation, the tribal court order shall undergo the state process of recognition to be transferred to the jurisdiction of the state 
pursuant to Arizona Revised Statutes, Title 12, Article 2, Subsection 12-136. Residents of tribal lands have a separate COE, COT process that is governed by their own laws and policies. The tribal court order will specify the type and amount of treatment needed and is initiated by the tribal court. To secure COT off reservation, the tribal court order must be recognized or transferred to the jurisdiction of the state. The transferring of a tribal court order is initiated by the tribal court. The tribal court order process begins when a tribal court order is filed with the county court within 30 days of determination to transfer the court order and is accompanied by an affidavit from the appropriate tribal court officer stating that no subsequent orders vacating, modifying, or reversing the order filed have been entered by the tribal court. Responses from the receiving court must be filed within five days of receipt of filing the order. When a response is filed, the court may, at its discretion or at the request of the proposed patient, appoint counsel to represent them at any enforcement proceedings. The receiving county court may not assess the validity of the tribal court order. It can only assess its consistency with ARS 12-136, the statute that details the tribal processes for involuntary commitment. The receiving court judge shall attempt to resolve any issues raised regarding a tribal court order by contacting the tribal court judge who issued the order. Tribal court orders must undergo the recognition process to transfer the responsibility from tribal court to county court. For example, when a Native American person needs super services outside of the reservation is stipulated in the tribal court order. A determination is completed and the county court advises the tribal court of the approval or denial of the recognition request. Any facility licensed for COT may admit the proposed patient for involuntary treatment pending the filings of a tribal court's involuntary commitment order with the court. The tribal court order must be filed with the clerk of the court by close of business on the next day the court is open after the admission of the member, tribal holidays excluded. In the event the tribal court order is not filed with the court, by the close of business the next day, the facility must discharge the person. If the person is discharged pursuant to ARS 12-3136, the member shall be transported to the jurisdiction of the tribal court. Many Arizona tribes have their own Tribal Behavioral Health Authority or TREBA. Their contact information is posted on the ACCESS website. Forms may vary by county, so it is important to know the processes and forms for the county in which the proposed patient resides. Many resources are available to help. The documents needed for the emergent and non-emergent processes are listed here. Determine the geographic service area, or GSA, of the county where the proposed patient lives in order to determine where to file the paperwork. In the Northern GSA, Apache and Navajo counties use Change Point Psychiatric Hospital, Little Colorado Behavioral Health, and Community Bridges. Coconino County uses the Guidance Center for COE. Mojave County uses Southwest Behavioral Health, Kingman Recovery Unit for COE, and Southwest Behavioral Health for pre-petition screening. Yavapai and Gila counties use Pronghorn Psychiatry, Stone Ridge Centers, and Community Bridges, Inc. Solari operates the Northern GSA crisis line. Mobile crisis teams can be dispatched to any location. Call 1-877-756-4090 for crisis assistance. In the central GSA, Maricopa County uses Valley Wise Psychiatric Hospital for COE after a petition has been screened and accepted and Community Health Solutions conducts pre-petition screenings 
and COE. Solare operates the central GSA crisis line that can dispatch a mobile crisis team to any location. Call 1-602-222-9446 for assistance with a crisis. In the Southern GSA, Cochise County uses Community Bridges, Inc. and Community Health Associates for pre-partition screening and COE. Graham and Greenlee counties use Community Bridges, Inc. for pre-partition screening and COE. La Paz and Yuma counties use Horizon Health and Wellness for pre-partition screening and COE. Pima, Pinnell, and Santa Cruz counties use Community Bridges, Inc. for pre-partition screening and Connections Health Solutions Crisis Response Center for pre-partition screening and COE. The Southern Arizona Crisis Line operates a Southern GSA crisis line that can dispatch a mobile team to any location. Call 1-866-495-6735 for assistance with a crisis. The resources in this presentation are subject to change due to access contracts with health plans and according to the needs of each county. These resources can help applicants as they navigate the COE, COT process, find support and speak with others who have gone through this process. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, has chapters throughout the state. Call 480-994-4407 for more information and resources. Now it is time to check your knowledge. What is the purpose of court-ordered treatment? Is it A, to get revenge on a family member? B, to intervene due to symptoms of severe mental illness? C, to make a person take care of their legal obligations? Or D, to obtain behavioral health treatment for a person who is unwilling or unable to accept voluntary treatment? The answer is D to get a person behavioral health treatment who is unwilling or unable to accept voluntary treatment. The intent of Title 36 processes must only be to help someone who cannot help themselves. Who may fill out an application for court-ordered evaluation? Is it A, only immediate family members? B, only caring friends? C, any responsible adult? Or D, neighbors within four blocks? The answer is C. Any responsible adult can file an application for involuntary evaluation. What is the reason a person can be petitioned? A, danger to self, B, danger to others, C, persistently and acutely disabled, D, gravely disabled, or E, all of the above? The answer is E, all of the above. DTS, DTO, PAD, or GD are all reasons a person can be petitioned. What is an example of danger to self? A, may attempt an act of suicide. B, banging their head against a wall. C, kicking the family dog. D, intentionally cutting their arm with a razor blade. E, A, and B, or F, A, B, and D? The answer is F. A, B, and D are all examples of danger to self. What is an example of danger to others? Is it A, kicking at the advertisements at a bus stop? B, threatening to hurt or kill someone? C, befriending unknown people? D, hitchhiking on a freeway, E, waving around a gun at a truck stop, F, A and D, or G, B and E? The answer is G. B and E are examples of danger to others. What is an example of persistently and acutely disabled? Is it A, a person who attends behavioral health appointments? B, impairment of a person to make informed decisions. C, a person who takes psychiatric medications. 
D, a person who is incapable of understanding their need for treatment, E, A and C, or F, B and D? The answer is F. B and D are examples of persistently and acutely disabled. What is an example of gravely disabled? Is it A, a person with an incapacitating mental disorder, a person who takes different psychiatric medications, C, a person who, because of a mental disorder, is unable to get out of bed and feed themselves, D, A and B, E, A and C, or F, A, B, and C? The answer is E. A and C are examples of gravely disabled. A person can have their COT reviewed for termination by A, not showing up for scheduled psychiatric appointments, B, talking with friends and family members, C, requesting a judicial review, or D, consulting a police officer? The answer is C. Requesting a judicial review is the only way a COT can be terminated prior to its expiration date. How often must judicial review be offered? A, every 30 days, B, every 60 days, C, every 90 days, D, annually, or E, whenever a judge decides to offer one? The answer is B, every 60 days. What are the possible collateral consequences of COT? Is it A, unable to own, possess a gun? B, adverse action when applying for permits or being background checked? C, Medication compliance, D, must attend psychiatric appointments every month, or E, all of the above? The answer is E. All of the above are potential consequences of COT. How long is a COT order enforceable? Is it A, 90 days, B, 180 days, C, 365 days, or D, per the court's recommendation? The answer is C. 365 days is the duration of a COT order. To file a tolling order, you must confirm that the patient is physically located out of state. Is that A, true, or B, false? The answer is B, false. A tolling order can be filed whenever a patient is missing, regardless of their location. A COT order may be used to get someone with a substance abuse problem into rehab. Is that A, true, or B, false? The answer is B, false. The Title 36 processes cannot be used to get someone into rehab, and substance abuse alone does not qualify as danger to self. When would the COE COT processes not be appropriate? Is it A, to build a legal case against someone? B, to enact revenge? C, when the custody of a child is involved? D, when the child has been removed because of abuse or neglect? Or E, all of the above? The answer is E. All of the above answers are inappropriate reasons to enact the COE COT processes. The Access Crisis webpage lists suicide crisis lines by county and frequently asked questions. Applicants can find assistance at these web resources or by calling Access. Access thanks these individuals for their contributions to this presentation.